My name is Varis Sagir. I work as a Chief Technology Officer in Cisco Service Provider Business Unit. Today I will talk about 5G and what are the main requirements from 5G transport perspective and what is Cisco solution. So what are the key 5G use cases? And 5G has been talked about since about 2015, 2016 now. So I have been involved in pretty much most of the deployment in the world and has been involved in this uh, transformation. The key use cases for 5G are three. One is enhanced mobile broadband. This is according to 3GPP. EMBB, it, this includes fixed wireless access. What basically it means is high bandwidth to the user. We talk about one gigabit per second to the user. What it means from transport perspective is increased bandwidth and capacity. The second use case is massive machine type communication, MMTC. This means scale and reliability. This doesn't require high bandwidth. It's more about scale, low bandwidth, but reliability is important. The third use case is totally new. This is the one which doesn't, didn't exist in LTE at all. That's ultra reliable, low latency communication, meaning mission critical use cases. Basically, we are looking at service latencies of one to 25 milliseconds. That means you are looking at, just to give you an idea, today's radios only have a 25 millisecond of round trip latency. In this case, you are talking about the entire service to be one to 25 millisecond. What are those services? Augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, tactile internet, you know, there are multiple smart grids. Those are the use cases being defined there. What it really means is that network architecture needs to change. You have to push data plane to the edge, and that basically requires network transformation. And some of these emerging technologies, which I just talked about from applications, entertainment, all those would require network change. So out of all these three, the first use case operators are deploying today. The third use case is the one operators are planning for it. This doesn't, as of today, there is not a use case which is being deployed in the world today for now, but it will be coming, especially with this uh, new uh, applications coming up. So if I break down what are the five major architecture pillars of 5G, what enables them, what changes are happening? The big one is NR. NR is 5G new radio. What exactly it means? Higher flexibility, higher bandwidth radio. When I use the word higher bandwidth, we are talking about massive MIMO. We are talking about a lot more bandwidth. And I will show you the calculation, how, the, how, you, transform, how you convert these megahertz to the, to the bits and you see the difference is coming from LTE to 5G. Low latency, this is extremely critical. People are, the, they're targeting one millisecond of radio latency uh, to enable some of these services. So 5G NR is extreme, is, is one of the most important thing in the 5G. And the interesting part is it is getting packet based. It is getting, moving from the CIPRI, moving from TDM to the packet based architecture. And we will talk about that, how it, basically significantly has an impact. The second one is a big one is the decomposition. When I use our decomposition, what I mean is, is basically decomposition of radio. So for example, you had the baseband unit before, BBU. Now it's been broken into two components, CU and DU. CU stands for centralized unit, DU stands for distributed unit. Or the packet core, we use our CUPS. Packet core was a you know, single entity. Now you can divide into control plane, and user plane. And we'll talk about that, why it matters, because breaking them helps to push those components closer to the edge, and that will enable some of those new services. So decomposition is a big one, and then going cloud native. So the idea is, if you have something on-prem, you can put them in a cloud. All those workloads, CU, DU, packet core, they will all be container and hosting it in, 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 in a general purpose hardware. Programmability is extremely important. Edge computing being talked about a lot. How, and I'll touch base upon this later in my slide also, how different workloads can be placed in different parts of the network. And then converge transport. Transport is the basically foundation which connects all those components together. It is, has to be extremely reliable. When I use the word converge, it has to be wireline and wireless both. It cannot be just wireless. And this is just because of the cost reasons. And lastly, to bring it all together, you need to have the closed loop automation, multi-domain, 
And another big terminology which has been talked about, and I will touch base also in my slide, is network slicing. This is something being defined, and basically you are dividing your network into logical networks to deliver uh, specific services. So this is a 5G architecture. Some of these services, by the way, in ORAN been also being done for 4G. So don't get be surprised if you see 4G workloads having decomposition and uh, cloud native architecture, just like 5G. A little bit, I'm gonna go deep into this RAN. It helped to understand when I use our decomposition, remember I said baseband unit, baseband unit is the radio controller is the one which basically controls all the radio. So the decomposition we talk about is two components, CU and DU. The heavy lifting is done by the DU part. Now, today's LT radios sits here. This is radio. This is the antenna which you see outside. And then you have what we call it as basically split eight. And it's based on CIPRI. CIPRI is TDM time division. So either you have a traffic or you don't have a traffic, you will still see a traffic there. So CIPRI is not that efficient when it's doing radio. However, what if we are, what's happening in 5G and the new radio standards which are coming up, they are going one split higher, meaning this lo-fi will be in your radio head, RRH. Why it matters? It significantly will reduce the bandwidth 10 times. And for this, we, we use the term split 7-2. 7-2x in ORAN, but it's a split seven basically. So the, the protocols new, which has been defined is eCIPRI, which is enhanced CIPRI, is an evolution of CIPRI. By the way, CIPRI is not a 3GPP standard. It is a forum which has the uh, Nokia Ericsson guys have created this. ORAN on the other hand is the new promise that you, know, you can get the best of radios and best of baseband unit and best of radio out there with consensus of operators and vendor together, they have defined this split, which is called 7-2x. And then there's an ROE, which is IEEE 1914.3. This split helps to reduce the bandwidth, and this helps uh, split helps with the packetization of radio also. So what it means from a stack perspective, simple. As you go down the stack, it's good for radio, but bad for basically expensive, expensive for transport. As you go up the stack, the transport becomes cheaper. That's the main takeaway. As you go down, the latencies are strict. So another split which we people talk about a lot, this will be mid-haul, which is called option two or F1, defined by 3GPP. And I will show you the deployment. This will be one of the most common deployment in the world. And, uh, uh, and, and anything above CU, we call it backhaul. Uh, we actually yeah. have a question on Twitter from uh, Rasmus Berkland. He wants to know, is it on the Cisco roadmap to integrate this 5G RAN technology into some of your existing hardware platforms, or is this still kind of positioned in a separate hardware category that's being aimed at a specific set of providers? Very good question. These will be implemented by RAN vendors. This is not for Cisco Transport to integrate. Uh, it's basically will be an integration. You, if, if you have ORAN, like, you know, you have multiple RAN vendors or Ericsson, Nokia, those will be sitting baseband unit and DU CU vendors. They will be bringing these uh, uh, components into their product. All right. And Thank they, you very they, much. Yeah. So there is one component I will talk about later in my slide that we will be integrating, but it's a very specific component for a function. But generally, this is RAN vendor products, not Cisco. Now, since I talked about packet, so today when we when we are deploying CIPRI based architecture, we uh, the the, the the uh, general deployment way is to use passive DWDM or active DWDM. However, when you are deploying front hall, it's not optimal to do passive DWDM. There are multiple reasons. They have issues with operations. You have to match the colors. On the other hand, what we are, what we have, we, we suggested that hey, you know, and the world is moving towards this. By the way, go to packet. Packet brings stat statistical multiplexing advantages, cost effective, topology independent, service visibility. So it's actually taking your backhaul, mid-haul architecture of packet all the way to the front hall. And that will significantly sim simplify the operations and will bring intelligence to the RAN network. And, and I will show you one example how we have done this in the uh, RAN network, that part. I just want to clarify what you mean by that, because I think what I understood you to say is that instead of, you know, instead of all the towers, instead of purely it being, a, you know, an L1, L2 thing out there that you're 
that you're injecting L3, that that's, that's transport via L3 uh, yes. to Threat Hall. Uh, that's what I, I thought I heard you saying. That's what basically I'm talking about. Basically, for okay. layer two traffic, you carry it in a SRBGP VPN and uh, and transport it to the to the baseband unit, and then you get all the benefits of fast convergence, and you know you can do a lot. What does the underlay topology look like for that? What are the protocols involved in that in that transport from a routing perspective, or or from an L2 perspective? So I will touch base upon that. Hold on to that thought, but I'll no tell worries. you. Okay. Yeah. So there will be L2 technologies because all the radio right now supporting L2 right now. They are not supporting L3. There is a roadmap for L3 though. But underlying te te uh, technologies would be, you know, taking L2, putting into segment uh, BGP EV EVPN. You can do in L2 and putting segment routing there. I will. I will show you one the stack uh, later coming in. I think there's some clarifications we should probably make because I don't know that a lot of the audience is going to understand or have experience with what the difference between DWDM and a packet front end is. So it, if you wanna explain that a little bit, I mean, I'll give a, what I'm thinking is, you know, in a DWDM environment, you're simply transporting wavelengths across a fiber, right? And then you have a active equipment on either end that understands the frequency. That's where the, the matching color comment cut came in that you made. So basically it's a color of light. The equipment has to understand that color of light, then be able to tra trans, uh, transcribe that, you know, change that, convert that into um, ethernet because it's not ethernet at that point. It's just wavelengths. So what you're saying is you're gonna take optical wavelengths, which is specialty DWDM equipment, and you're gonna instead use packet equipment in there, which is what a lot more folks are familiar with. So like, you know, a router that can do MPLS or segment routing. I do want to make one clarification. Um, is in these environments, is there also optical equipment in there? Because a lot of these require the amplification that, um, you know, optical network will give as well. So is that very, still exists? Nick, very good point. Front hall doesn't require amplification. These distances are less than 40 kilometers or less than okay. 15 kilometers. So at, at most, you're probably using long reach, standard long reach optics. In fact, ER, LR would be an ER is a stretch in this case because it's just a latency. And I'll show you the next slide, which explains this thing. But just to clarify, it, it can be active, it can be passive. Passive is much cheaper, and that's why people use passive mostly. But you are on the right track, though. Uh, a lot of this traffic back. Uh, that, you know, of course, still requires layer two. Uh, I think the traditional mechanism in wireless to top shell was using GTP. Um, so when we're using SR, SR uh, carried uh, layer two VPNs, are we uh, able to now kind of benefit from some of the TE there that we couldn't necessarily get when we were doing GTP? Uh, like from a flow hashing standpoint, is that able to allow us to maybe work a little bit better in a ECMP style fashion? Or do we still suffer from a lot of the same issues? So so GTP, by the way, starts from DU to CU and CU to the packet core. This is GTP. We will still be doing load balancing. This is a front hall. GTP is not there in the front hall. Okay. So I'll, I'll touch base upon that topic, by the way, Chris, that, uh, that how GTP and how we're going to move the workloads to get the GTP termination early. So but this is a very important to understand why the latency. So when you talk about front hall, you are looking, by the way, this, all these latencies are one way. Your latency number is 75 microsecond or 100 microsecond. By the way, when I use the word hence, I mean Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung. Okay. This is LTE latency when you're using ERAN. So 75 microsecond and assume, by the way, five microsecond is for per kilometer. So there's not a lot of room for, for in latency in this case. So your distances get pretty short. You, the, what I've seen globally, 10 kilometers is a distance, 15 is a stretch. With ORAN, however, that number may go a little bit up. With ORAN, if you, that number goes to 200 microsecond or 160 microsecond, then you can go up to 30 kilometers or something, okay? And so that's why I put less than 40 kilometers in front hall, and there are different traffic types in front hall. It's a VLAN tag user and control plane is a layer two traffic today. The packet size can be a jumbo frame in this case. Why? Because they would like to pack as many packets as possible. Synchronization plane is untagged multicast. Management plane is IPv6 or IPv4. 95% of traffic is user and control plane. Okay, there is a roadmap for uh, vendors to put this in layer three. 
it's user and control plane, but today it is a layer two traffic. That is the only layer two traffic in a mobile network today. Now, mid hauler F1 is basically between CU and DU. That latency is a little bit relaxed, five millisecond to 25 millisecond. Okay, that's why you can use lit fiber. In front hall, you have to use dark fiber. There is no, and that's one of the reason front hall is, will, will be very limited deployment as compared to mid hall. Mid hall will be like 60, 70% of the world. Fiber is very hard to get. Even the fiber rich countries are struggling. In traffic types in mid hall, it's all IP. And it will be the packet size can go from 800 bytes to 9K jumbo frame bytes. So, and the UE usually is around 1500 bytes of traffic. So. That's basically, it's important to understand that number that helps to dictate the distances you will see in the network. And I'm coming to the slide which shows all of them together. So I'll, I'll touch base on that. So this slide looks complicated. Don't worry about this. This is a packet core of control plane. This is a packet core for the data plane, UPF. Remember I talked about decomposition here. So Chris, to your question, GTP. So GTP termination is done by packet core. What it means is, in a mobile network, if you do not terminate the GTP tunnel, you don't understand what the traffic is looking for. You have to terminate it on the packet core. Traditionally in LTE, these packet core were centralized, so you have to terminate that packet all the way. But do you know the percentage of traffic in mobile networks, uh, video traffic percentage is 75% video traffic. So what UPF does is they break it. Now you can terminate the GTP tunnel on UPF. And once the, if you terminate it, you can offload to the internet. That basically gives you predictability and pay, get rid of all those traffic, which is service provider keeps on paying for this, right? So this is a packet core. And, and then second thing, what it's showing here is this is a RAN part of the network. What is important in this picture is all these interfaces are IP, all of them, except for the DU, I showed you the front hall, which is L2 today. So, this is something important to understand that IP is the way to go because all the standards have evolved to IP. Okay. Now this picture is a little bit more detailed, but I will, this is all the architecture types which we talked about. Firstly, if you read this document, if you get a chance, ORAN Workgroup 9, this is the first time they have defined this. The, uh, and Simon Sprags is part of my uh, team and he is one of the author of this document. In fact, he is the author of the document. So what we are showing here, CRAN, centralized RAN, which I talked about. So ORU, and then you have the router, which I showed you, and then ODU, which is sitting on a COTS hardware. This is the radio controller, and OCU may be sitting at a central site. You need dark fiber, and this is ECPRI, basically, uh, uh, protocol, which we are using here. So this is CRAN. As I mentioned, why people want to go for CRAN? CAPEX and OPEX reduction. There is no baseband unit at cell site. It's a lean site, and that helps with the spectral efficiency. It helps with gains. Another thing is CRAN, you can have a front hall and a mid hall topology also, meaning DU and CU can be put in different places. Why you want to do this? The reason you want to do this is because you want to keep the ODU because there's a one to many relationship there. So one CU can manage many DUs. Again, a, center of central, a form of centralization. Then there's another deployment which you will see in fact, what I am talking to operators, most of the deployment will be mid hall because you can see here, this will be a kind of a backhaul provider sitting in the middle. And then you have a transport network and you can put CU at a central site. Centralization helps with the you know, uh, resources perspective. The last one is DRAN. Today in the world, 95% of the deployment in the world is DRAN, meaning all these three components are at the cell site. That's basically the typical deployment. And, to, and many of our packet core today are mostly centralized. However, in the new world, then you can put the UPF closer to the edge and terminate it and send it to the internet. That will enable ultra reliable low latency. There is no other way you can do this. So yeah. I think I heard you say the EPC is going to be distributed now. So I'm assuming that's, you know, that's using, you know, a cloud native architecture that you're Correct. using to distribute that, you know, the EPC, whereas, you know, traditionally that would be, you know, somewhere else and becomes in, you know, a point in the data plane. So does that mean the data plane is distributed as well? If the EPC is distributed? This is data plane distributed. This is UPF. That's the okay. one which does that. Okay. So in the underlay for that, in the underlay for that is IPv6 or IPv4 or both? It can be IPv6 also. It can be IPv4 okay. also. So it's basically up to the operator and we are helping with SRV6, like some of the, you know, upcoming providers, they are going to use SRV6 to do that. 
Got it. What's and what's the you know SRV six has been a very um, you know in the segment routing world SRV six has been been a bit of a controversial protocol. Um, what SRMPLS versus SRV six? What do you see the advantages of SRV six versus SRMPLS for this application? So you can use SRMPLS in the first phase. You will see a lot more SRMPLS. SRV six will be uh, right now. A uh, few operators are looking at, uh, as they are evolving their networks. Greenfield especially will be looking at that too. By the way, SRV6 topic, Kevin will be touched in detail by Jose. He will talk about this. But in terms cool. of you know scale simplification, SRV6 basically is provides a much better picture there. And obviously, if, if somebody is an MPLS, move, they, have, they move to SRMPLS. So that's something uh, is an easy transition rather than moving from uh, uh, moving directly from MPLS to SRV6 for some operators. So it just depends where they are in the journey, what kind of expertise they have, what kind of comfortability. The operator has all those play into the picture from technology perspective, both of them can do the job. SRV6 just provide better scale and NFV and application programming. All those come with SRV6 too. So one more question on this architecture here is in the in the design that you have, I'm assuming this is a mobility provider, looks like a mobility provider to me. Um, a lot of the mobility providers, and then you know, you also have five G, you know, fixed providers for just you know delivering bandwidth to a home or business. Does this architecture change at all if you move from mobility into fixed wireless? That's the beauty of this design, that you will have converged network. You can put wireline and wireless, front hall, mid hall. You can put uh, ORAN, non ORAN. It will be a multi service network. In reality, you will not see a, just a pure mobile network moving forward just because of cost reason. So to, to answer your question. No, it will not change. And that I'll show you the, the, the final converge, what we have pr proposing, all the technologies remain same and you can deliver both. Okay. What about the convergence, uh, especially for the front hall? So it is a layer two, uh, what you are doing for the convergence, high availability? Meaning in terms of, sorry, I didn't get the question. You mean the layer two in front hall, how will we do the converge with it? You, you yeah, can- be In case of failure, let's say, uh, what would be the convergence there? Oh, uh, you get the same convergence. I'll, I'll show you a test which we did. We did a test in RAN networks, zero packet, zero call drop using TILFA. It does exactly the way the packet works. That's the beauty of this whole, okay. and, and, I'll, and I'll show you this test. By the way, last thing I want to just touch base upon is this LTE will also be there. So it's not just 5G, it will be LTE, 5G, wireline, wireless, everything together. And we have ways to even transport CIPRI in a packet. That we call it radio over Ethernet. So packetization of CIPRI is another part of bringing the legacy into the existing packet network. Now, considering in service providers, we have met a star topology between the DU site and the remote radio site. Uh, why do you think DWDM cannot work in such point to point, you know, uh, topologies basically it will certainly work it's just the operationally challenging it's and it's it just gives you more insight it gives you visibility it gives you flexibility it gives you fast convergence otherwise it's just a dumb pipe that's the difference working is not an issue it's just a simplification but dwdm is more simplified than the ip layer do you agree but yeah but it's no it doesn't give you insight it's a pipe so in DWDM passive, you have to match the colors and it creates a big operational challenges. If for people who are climbing towers, it's not a small thing. It's a cost. Secondly, you have no telemetry. You don't know what exactly is happening in the network. There's no fast convergence also if you have alternate path there. So those are the things overall in a network. If you are going there, it helps there in that case. And, and keep in mind statistical multiplexing. With eCIPRI, you're getting packet. So with packet, Stat marks from the, comes in. Passive DWDM doesn't doesn't, doesn't understand stat marks. Yeah, why would you need stat multiplexing in a star topology where you have just point to point fiber? Because then you have to put the interface accordingly. Because the uplink interface, the bandwidth which I'm showing here, you don't need to use the same bandwidth. You have to just use the peak bandwidth. So in that case, it helps. So from okay. uh, and that's yeah. So just, just one example of an operator going from LTE to 5G. So all these numbers, we, when I started working on that part, you know, all these different megahertz and, but the main thing is this in this picture to remember this in 5G, this thing, bandwidth, that gets more. That's one of the big thing you get there, 100 megahertz of channels. What, what, and in LTE, you can do carrier aviation, but the chunk maximum is 20 megahertz, number one. Massive MIMO, 
4G was more about, you know, max 44R. By the way, guys, keep in mind, whatever MIMO you see here, your cell phone has to support that MIMO. Apple latest phone support 44R. Latest one. Previous phone doesn't support any like 2 tr Then you get massive MIMO with it. All these together means what? Front haul, you are looking at a bandwidth of 74 gigabit per second. By the way, this is a good big spectrum of 615 megahertz. How does it translate to my interface? I need a 100 giggy interface. How does it translate to mid-haul bandwidth? You are looking at around 12 gigabit of bandwidth. How does it translate to a back-haul bandwidth? You are looking at 10 gigabit of bandwidth. By the way, keep this in mind, these numbers are at the higher side. In actual deployment, you don't see all the radios transporting at the same time. But compare this number with the average of LTE in the world. Average is 300 megabit per second. That's the average LTE cell site throughput. So all these numbers translate to one thing. Your access interfaces, when you build a network, will are going went from 1 giggy to 10 giggy. Now it's 25 giggy. 25 giggy will be the new 10 giggy in the industry. Everywhere, all the interfaces, devices, radio, will have native 25 gig interface. You will have, if you are doing wireline and wireless X together, you will be seeing bandwidth going from, in a ring architecture, can go up to, or point to point, can go up to 400 gig. This is where Rana will talk about the RON architecture also, how that will help in this case. Then you have your edge and core, since you have ripple effect of bandwidth, you will be looking at how the bandwidth will grow from, uh, in the edge too. Point is this, when you are building these networks, the, when we talk about 5G increases the bandwidth, this is what it means by 5G increasing the bandwidth. And lastly, keep this in mind, 10 gig interfaces will be there in the radios, 25 gig will be there for massive MIMO, so you need, lot, you need 10 gig, 25 gig, 100 gig, 400 gig in different parts of the network. So when you are selecting transport, you need to take into account. Now, I did talk about data center coming into the picture. In LTE, there was no concept of any edge data centers. It's all centralized data center. In 5G, you may see far edge DCs. You may see edge DCs, regional DCs, central DCs. These two, especially, are expensive DCs. These are not regular data centers. These are maybe three racks, two racks, and they have really expensive. So you need to be very careful what you are putting there. Real, getting real estate is one of the biggest challenges. Now, all these workloads, DU, CU, so that's why people would be putting more DU at far edge DCs. They may be in 10,000. In edge DCs, CU and UPF, maybe in, thou, in, in thousands. Regional DCs, maybe hundreds. But the key thing is, think about, now you are managing those sites. So these workloads not, are not in hundreds, in 10,000 sites. So you have to take care of the cloud native architecture or your, your, your management needs to take care of these parts. By the way, you in, your, in a network, you may not see all of them, you may see some of them, but you will see multiple data centers, and that's how people will be deploying, depending on the service requirement, they need to place a workload, workload closer to the user so that they can enable those services. So what I talked about, I'm gonna summarize what you need from a 5G network. You need stringent KPIs. EMBB, meaning high bandwidth, low latency, densification, lower power, and reliability. The interesting part is this. Usually, either people do low latency or high bandwidth. Combining them together, that creates a big challenge. That's why you need flexible service placement in the network. That's one of the key requirements. Depending on, I think, Kevin, you asked me this question, wherever you want the workload, you should be able to place it without changing the network, your, your, unifo your forwarding plane, and, and your control plane. So IP is the basis for the entire thing for 5G infrastructure, any to any connectivity, many to one relationship, all that will be there. 5G functions like RAN and mobile core are virtualized, so they need to be put in data centers. This is a highly dynamic environment when slicing, virtualization, cups comes into the picture. These components will can move around, they can appear, disappear, and then different slices may require mobile components and different DCs to meet SLAs. Transport needs to support layer two, layer three both, you transport SLAs for service and slices. It should be simple to provision and it should be cost effective. So those are high, the high level requirement what you'd need from 5G. If I think back to the existing architecture and especially in, and I work on, on RF networks quite a bit, but more around the packet, you know, design side of, of the core and, and how that works and interacts with the towers. 
And one of the things that, you know, is a current challenge that we, we saw with an extension in the routing protocol is if I've got GTP tunnels from uh, 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 an eNode B back to an EPC and I'm bringing that back and I want to do ECMP and routing, you know, that's all kind of abstracted by the GTP tunnel. So there's an extension, you know, we use in the routing protocol to be able to see the origin, you know, of the traffic for the users and then, you know, use ECMP in the network. When you're distributing, and for life me, I can't remember what the RFC is, but when you distribute the EPC like you are, how does that how does that translate if a segment routing or SRV6 is going to be my underlay? How does that make it from the radio to, you know, does that change at all? Like as if I want to be able to make sure that, you know, if I need to, you know, take a SID and segment routing and steer traffic, you know, around the architecture to do traffic engineering, how does the how does the packet core communicate with you know, either the underlay or the overall transport to make those kinds of decisions. So, Kevin, to answer your question, firstly, there's a feature, as you mentioned, GTP load balancing in Cisco routers. You need to enable yeah. that for ECMP. It doesn't, it's not enabled by default. It's enabled for MPLS. You have to enable for MPLS. There are two modes, IP and MPLS. So both you need to enable. It doesn't change. So, in terms of GTP, and by the GTP is usually the whole thing about GTP load balancing is it's always point to point because you have a radio, DU, or CU. So GTP will be between mid-hall, keep this in mind, there are two different GTP tunnels. DU to CU is a separate GTP tunnel. CU to packet core is a separate GTP tunnel. In both cases, yeah. you need to enable load balancing. It doesn't change. It's the same behavior. Okay, so same protocol, same, same, same protocol. principle that we're going just on a distributed scale. Exactly. We tried because we, we think that GTP is the one which is limiting mobile evolution. We are trying to get this replaced by SRV6. That will greatly change the game. And, okay. Uh, but anyways, 3GPP takes a long time, it's just years of work, but we are pursuing that. So it's been widely discussed that, you know, especially with roaming, but in general with GTP being reasonably open, that it, you know, there may be um, security implications of that particular technology. Is there anything that you're thinking about that addresses some of those issues that may come up because this is all packet based now it's no longer uh you know it's no longer the, the Nick, there has been ipsec being recommended there and but, but that they have to do you can do sec gateway security gateway you can send everything together the challenge in general i can tell you in many in especially in north america there's not much uh the security becomes a big overhead but inherent, you can do it. You can do IPsec. You can look at MacSec. You can do, you know, technologies there. In general, uh, only people are trying to do where they going through a part of the network which is untrusted. They would try to do IPsec. If it's trusted, they would keep it on their own. It's just too much overhead to do these things. And this is not just. This is like the technology in general it has nothing to yeah. do with Cisco or Nokia or whoever. No, no, it's, it's it's a general it's a general operational challenge. It's it's not as straightforward and it's global, by the way. I've talked to many operators, they have all had the same issues. Yep. So, and and, and yeah, it should be, like you said, just to reiterate, there are mechanisms for dealing with it. Uh, absolutely. There are many, many. All right. Thank so you. How, how do we solve this no problem? How do we solve this? How do we solve this entire thing which I just talked about? Our solution is start from the cell site all the way to your core network, having a unified forwarding plane, segment routing, MPLS or V6, doesn't matter and unified service plane BGP VPN. Why, and BGP VPN means L3 VPN or L2 VPN, depending on your basically traffic types. And then you need to, one other thing to keep this in mind, that in 5G network, clocking is extremely important in the front hall network, this part between radio and DU. Why is it important? eCIPRI doesn't carry the clock, CIPRI carries the clock. So everyone who is working in mobile needs to understand PTP and Synky because that without this, your radio will never come up. So there's a very good book written by a couple of my team members, Shahid Ajmeri and, and Dennis Hagarty. You should check out this book on Cisco Press. It actually, both of them have done this for 10 years, by the way, but timing is extremely critical in that part of the network. And then you have to have a trusted infrastructure. So that's basically enables a very simplified end-to-end -end converge architecture with open interfaces. So that's basically our proposal to not to change anything. And when I talk about network slicing, it will exactly use the same technology. So you are not changing anything and getting the same behavior. Is there anything you guys are doing to try to 
work around running timing over mediums that might introduce litter uh, jitter sorry um specifically when i think about running timing over transponders at higher and higher speeds you need you know fec and things like that which can actually introduce really small jitter which can actually make p2p unviable across transponder links and things like that so is there anything being worked on to address that in our transport routers we are going for class c timing everywhere so class c timing is the default which we are going with that's what we are recommending and then from packet perspective you know uh ptp and Sinky, and making sure that you know we we have all the uh uh standards integrated there but i will get back to you on the transponder part we should probably define what PTP is, because I think a lot of folks that don't work in service provider and provisioning space it's probably 15, aren't familiar with it. Right, it's a 1588 clocking, packet-based clocking, based, the clocking is carried by packet. You can do this in two ways. You can put this, uh, uh, you know, a GPS at a central site and distribute the clock, or you can put GPS at every cell site. The, you know, cost-effective way is doing distribution through a central site, but some people want to do it at the cell site also, that's also, uh, Okay, to do with that. So for folks that are configuring equipment out there, this is very similar in concept to NTP. It's just significantly higher precision. The RFC is 1588, I think, right? And it's used a lot in DOCSIS networks and other you know, RF networks as well. So just to tie that into something folks might be familiar with. And, and as I'm showing here, you can see that these globes and caching offloading all your, you know, uh, Hulu's and, and YouTube, which is 75, 80% of the traffic in the world, which is continued to grow, uh, putting your UPF at your, you know, uh, at your uh, pre-aggregation site will significantly help with the bandwidth reduction also. So you can focus on uh, you know, different uh, more services. So I am going to show you how, and this was a question I think somebody asked me, different traffic types. So segment routing, can MPLS or V6, right, in the network. So when there's a layer two, this part of the network, and Yiri, by the way, is going to talk about EVPN in the session later today. So we are using point-to-point -point VPWS in this case uh, for front hall, and that works out well with the underlay can be SR or SR MPLS or SR V6. But this front hall is the layer two only traffic, but in front hall, there are three traffic types, if you recall. There's a management traffic, which is L3. This is where you will use L3 VPN. There is uh, untagged multicast that you don't need to worry about. Then in mid hall and back hall, as I mentioned, all of this traffic is layer three. You use L3 VPN to do that, right? And then you need to take care of QS uh, also to make sure that you get the right queuing uh, priorities uh, to the traffic. Sure. Because there's an argument we always have as network engineers. We go back and forth about, you know, Q, QoS and, and bandwidth. And if I keep adding bandwidth, I don't need QoS, which is not, not something that I, I subscribe to and, you know, that you need shaping. But, you know, if you're looking at we're going to add these, these, this massive amount of fiber and this, this to the cell site and the tower, these massive speed increases, why is the addition of bandwidth not enough? Where does the QoS come into play where it's not just bandwidth, but I need quality of service because of something that's not just a function of raw bandwidth availability? Kevin, I have done this design with tier one. I had this debate with tier one and I showed them why it matters. Very simply put, in a point to point, you will not, in a point to point, when you're doing this together, micro burst comes into the picture. That's one reason. If you're doing in a, co in a back hall and mid hall network, fiber cut. That's what matters. When you cut the fiber, the traffic gets higher on the other links. This is where it matters. In a, in a steady environment, everything is good. So that's what you need to take care of. What about like a type of situation like earthquake, for example, when it happens, uh, many people uh, will just start using the, your uh, mobile network, for example, and at the same time, and you want to prioritize some people over others, maybe hospitals, maybe uh, police and those kind of people. So quality of service uh, in those ki kind of situation also is necessary. Yep, and radio management also matters. Uh, you are, in, even in this slide, you're showing uh, L2 uh, VPN in the last mile and then L3 VPN all the way up to the core. So why not make it simple and have one L3 VPN end to end? So why are you recommending L2 VPN in the last mile? No, it's just the matter where the traffic is terminating. In a front hall management, because the management station is there, L3 VPN is actually there between ODU and ORU. But since the front, I'm just showing the management plane, the management plane needs, the ORAN management itself is setting some application. But actually the VPN is ending here, ODU. The traffic has no significance after ODU. 
Okay. Makes sense? No, in the front hall. In the front yeah, hall, yeah. you are saying. Yeah. The front hall. This ends here. ODU. It's just the application. I'm. I'm sh that that application IP because somebody ORAN management needs to take care of this. But actual traffic ends at ODU. This has no significance between ODU and OCU. Okay. Clear. Thank you. So this I want to show you quickly. This is the one I talked about. This is a test we actually did with Ericsson Radio. It's pretty cool. As what we did is we had this 6630. This is 5G radio, Air 6448. Right? This is the first time we did the test that in a RAN network, we did the fast conversion using packet. We used TILFA. And what we did, we had this call running voice and video, and we cut the fiber. Guess what happened? Call runtime, there was no call downtime for 37 minutes because we ended the call. There was no cell went down because cell is the one which we looked at. So that is something which we proved that, you know, and keep this in mind, radios also have buffers, by the way. So that's what we proved that RAN networks needs to evolve. RAN networks needs to go packet. And that's where you get a lot of new, new technologies and innovation coming in. Today, it's just TDM, okay? Oh, would this allow me to get rid of ERPS as well uh, if I'm doing like a Metro E style? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So another big change is happening in the network is, is the operators, which Dish recently announced, they are putting workloads in cloud, like OCU, like, o sorry, like UPS. They're putting in cloud there, like AWS. This is where we are positioning a solution. You can do cloud agnostic networking, putting a virtual like XRV 9K router. What you can do is, remember I talked about segment routing in the on-prem? You can actually extend all the way to the on-prem and off-prem and move it all the way to the cloud. And we have a solution for that. And, and once you publish the white paper, you can see it. But the key takeaway is your workloads can sit anywhere and in infrastructure hosting is different in cloud. And that's why you need to take care of overlay routing to do that part. And we have a, and that's what we have, in, we are implementing in DISH. 5G requires the, all the changes that we talked about. We have tried to make it simplified. Time-sensitive networking, TSN, is there, but TSN is actually good for in a dual traffic types. In reality, it doesn't add that much value when you have a single traffic type, and it just gives you a benefit with a 25 gig interfaces with five microseconds. So we have implemented this in our portfolio, and you will be seeing this coming up. In a, uh, and we already are supporting this in our portfolio. So network slicing in general is exactly the same solution we have with packet-based. Because we think that network slicing, you don't need to change it. It's a shared resource, and it helps to deploy the same thing. So whatever I have talked about, you can do this in network slicing too. So all in all, this is basically a, a kind of the simplified converged 5G SDN transport from Cisco. Tom.